Thank you, David. Thank you for being invited. Here, this is a question where that audience response may still be, I don't know, at the end of our debates, because this is a little bit, the, the, the evidence is going to be a little bit lacking, at least the high-level evidence. And, you know, the role of surgical therapy for metastatic neuroendocrine has actually probably predated that of colorectal metastases, for example. There's a long history of surgical therapy for, for neuroendocrine disease. My argument is going to be not necessarily advocating it, but is there a role? And I think in this case, it's certainly, um, there's, there certainly is going to be a role. When we really frame the debate, there's always a role of surgical therapy, whether it's management of the symptomatic primary or an obstructed or some symptom or palliative surgery. But I think really what we're going to be <laughs> debating is, for example, should patients be offered curative R0 resection for resectable liver oligometastatic disease, much like we think about curative intent for colorectal liver metastases. Does surgical cytoreduction debulking as a different strategy for metastatic disease improve survival in the asymptomatic patient, a paradigm we typically don't apply to other solid tumors, but sometimes apply to this disease? Do we, do we need to rethink the role uh, of surgical therapy or debulking or resection in the face of these emerging effective systemic therapies you just heard about? How does this surgical therapy compare to other liver-directed therapies? And what do the current consensus guidelines say with regard to the role of surgery for metastatic neuroendocrine disease? First, it's often applied to the liver. When one thinks about surgical therapy for metastectomy for neuroendocrine, much like colorectal cancer, hepatic metastases are the things we're talking about. And largely, they dominate the first site of disease. If you look... Three quarters of metastases are going to involve the liver for neuroendocrine, whether it's pancreatic or midgut, and about half the patients have liver only as the site of metastatic disease, at least initially. In fact, as I mentioned, there's a long history of surgical therapy. If you look at these, look at these reports from decades ago, uh, started really by the Mayo Clinic, resecting metastatic disease. Many of these patients were functional, at least in uncontrolled studies suggested a trend. You can see the study on the left from Johns Hopkins comparing series tried to be matched, resected versus unresected, and other series from Mayo Clinic and others suggesting that there many patients enjoy a long-term survival, sometimes with five-year survival rates, 50, 60, 80 percent, 10-year survival rates, 50 percent. So Again, we didn't understand and still don't understand always the natural history without surgical therapy, but at least there was a hint suggesting the role of surgical therapy in many of these patients. Now, keep in mind what we're debating with regard to this. The, many patients do present with, have widely disseminated disease, extensive liver metastases, and some patients, in fact, have oligometastatic or limited metastases. We're not going to be focusing on surgical therapy for metastases in the case of extensive disseminated disease, but the real question is limited to those patients with limited metastases, but even potentially resectable metastases. For example, in this asymptomatic patient, you could see presenting with nodal involvement in a mid-gut uh, ileal carcinoid with apparent relatively limited metastases to the liver. Is this patient, should this be patient, should this patient be offered surgical therapy of the primary tumor and of the metastatic disease in this case, where at least the apparent imaging suggests that it's potentially resectable, much like we would manage a patient with colorectal stage four disease. And I would argue there is a, you'll see hopefully, a role for surgical therapy early on in this setting. When you look at the NCCN guidelines, it's pretty clear. If you look at local, regional, or, or metastatic disease, the first bullet is if complete resection possible, resect primary and metastases. So it's pretty clear. The issue is if resectable, so, and then moving forward. So the issue is how common is it that patients, in fact, one can achieve an R0 resection? Again, much like we do with colorectal cancer or others. Same, this is for pancreatic neuroendocrine, the same recommendations apply. Stage four disease, limited metastases, if complete resection possible, resect the metastasis and the primary. So I think here there's a clear role in this subset of patients. And so I think when one thinks about whether they're resectable or not, the criteria should be the same as those patients, for example, with colorectal liver metastases. We define it by the ability to, remove, to achieve an R0 complete resection of 
gross visible disease. In the case of the liver, it's, it's related to the structures, the, the remnant of uninvolved volume, the inflow, the outflow, and so forth. So high quality imaging is important to determine whether this patient is resectable and should be offered therapy. There are some distinctions, though, between colorectal metastatic disease and neuroendocrine. And so when we, should we really apply the same criteria? In colorectal cancer, oligometastatic disease, resectable disease in the liver, stage four, it's about 20, 25% of patients. We don't know the exact number, but it's pretty clear that more patients with metastatic neuroendocrine present with diffuse metastatic disease. So the resectable patient with metastatic disease is less common in neuroendocrine disease. Similarly, other systemic therapies in, that we apply in colorectal that can sometimes convert unresectable to resectable patients, we really don't apply such a strategy. We don't have high response rates there systemic therapies, although this may be a strategy that may apply in the future. As I say, we apply the curative intent strategy. We don't do cytoreductive debulking surgery in colorectal cancer. There's really limited role with limited benefit. Here, the contrary argument is that at least there's some data suggesting that perhaps there may be a role for incomplete, partial, near-complete resection of metastatic disease, particularly in the symptomatic patient. The issue, when you look at the long-term outcomes we'll look at in colorectal, the overall survive, five-year overall survival is about 40 to 60 percent, with recurrence rate, recurrence-free, uh, recurrence at five years of about 75 to 80 percent. In neuroendocrine resection of metastatic disease, overall survival is higher, 60 to 80 percent, if you look at those patients, but the recurrence rate is extremely high, 90 to 95 percent, so we're really not cure, we don't cure many colorectal metastasis resections. We really don't cure many patients with, color, with neuroendocrine metastases. The other issue that comes up not uncommonly is that it's not, it's not that uncommon to have patients with more miliary metas, disseminated metastatic disease, and imaging doesn't always detect this. So in this case of this patient potentially resectable on cross-sectional imaging on CT scan, when explored, this is a scenario that occasionally will be found. Multiple small miliary metastases that imaging didn't pick up. So this should not, though, be the argument that, okay, if you have an imaging that suggests resectable, this patient, quote, likely has miliary extensive metastases, therefore don't offer them surgical therapy. I think here there, it's showing a gap in the ability with perhaps better imaging, laparoscopy, and other things to rule out the patient who has unresectable uh, prior to proceeding with a curative intent strategy. What about the next step, the more controversial step, the cytoreductive or debulking resection? This is more controversial. But in fact, some suggest there's a, there may be a survival benefit to these patients, even who are asymptomatic, and particularly those who may have functional tumors, symptomatic tumors from the, from the functioning neuroendocrine tumor. At least some evidence perhaps suggests that, that debulking surgery may play a role in these patients. When you look at the NCCN guidelines, you've already seen for, in, for if they're not completely resectable, then you can see the recommendations below typically are a triotide-based, hormone-based therapy, as you've heard, is the first line. And then in those patients that progress, we see this potpourri of options here, ranging from systemic therapies to liver-directed therapies to cytoreductive surgery and ablation, granted a category 2B in this situation compared to some of the other approaches. So here, there's, even in the patient with a debulking option, at least the NCCN guidelines do recommend that cytoreductive surgery is an option. And even if you look at, even in the, in the patients with, there, there's even an, an option or a, a caveat that debulking surgery may even be considered as a first-line option in selected patients. When you continue to look at the guidelines and how this is phrased in the surgical principles, you can see uh, patients with symptomatic recurrence from local effects or hormones hypersecretion can be effectively palliated with subtotal resection of, large, of a large portion of the tumor, quote, typically more than 90 percent, et cetera. In fact, when you look at where this evidence comes from, it's fairly sketchy. And in fact, this, quote, 90 percent rule has been around for decades that, oh, if we can resect most of it, greater than 90 percent offer surgical therapy. It's hard to really know whether this 
this actual number should be debunked. In fact, this comes from studies decades old from the Mayo Clinic, from this early study, and this is in 1990, showing with residual disease, those patients still enjoy relatively uh, favorable long-term outcome. And so the recommendation at that time was if you can get, quote, more than 90% out, you should offer surgical therapy. And this is, in fact, stuck for decades. I'm not sure that necessarily this is the case. How do these long-term outcomes of surgical therapy compare to modern systemic series? Modern, again, we don't have a, a true comparison. You've seen some of the curves with progression-free survival and overall survival in PROMID, Radiant, PRT studies, and so forth. Still, many of these studies are showing five-year survival rates in the range of 50%, 60%, something like that. Many surgical series are showing 70 to 80%. Does this mean that surgical therapy is, uh, is better than the modern regimens? It's, uh, it's, it's really difficult to say. Let's look at some data, at least the retrospective reported series, which is all we have. This is the, from the uh, Brigham Dana-Farber, recently published this month, Management of Neuroendocrine Tumors from Liver Metastases Long-Term Outcomes. And you can see in their experience, again, these are not necessarily equal groups, but you can see hepatic resection leads the pack, radiofrequency ablation, other liver-directed therapies, systemic therapy, and observation. So it, at least it suggests that there is a, certainly a role for surgical therapy for liver metastases from neuroendocrine disease. And the other, you heard about liver-directed therapies. Many th look to compare uh, chemoembolization, bland embolization, Y90 compared to surgical therapy. Again, they're not always particularly match groups, but this is a, a retrospective series, multi-institution series comparing regional therapy to surgical therapy. Even in a propensity score matched uh, study, you can, the lower right curve demonstrating that surgical therapy appears to have better long-term uh, survival than, liver, than other liver-directed therapies. And here is a large multi-institutional study looking at uh, surgical therapy, 339 patients. And you can see here, this series showed that about half were carcinoid tumors. 34% were hormonally active and so forth. And this demonstrates on the right, patients with liver resection combined with extrahepatic disease had a poor outcome than those patients uh, with uh, liver-only disease. But you can see the 10-year survival rate in these patients reported in the range of about 60, you can see here, in the range of 51%, uh, 10-year overall survival. So it's certainly, at least the data suggests, now this is interesting, in this study that showed with comparing the incomplete versus the complete resection included all the groups. Patients with complete or R0, R1 resection, the hormonally active patients had the best outcome compared to those uh, with incomplete resections or the no hormonally non-functional patients. And this is the European Consensus Guidelines recommendation, resection with curative intent for these neuroendocrine tumors should be recommended if all disease can be resected, if it's well differentiated, acceptable morbidity, uh, absence of right heart insufficiency, absence of extra, ab extra abdominal metastases, and absence of peritoneal disease. So again, another guideline clearly pointing to the role of surgical therapy for metastatic disease. So in summary, I think based on the current evidence, granted uh, it's not as high level as we would like, Complete resection, when possible, of metastatic neuroendocrine does improve survival and is associated with long-term uh, even cure in some patients, although uncommon. While the benefit of cytoreductive, incomplete, partial, R0 resection is less clear, I think there's some compelling evidence that even in this group of patients with neuroendocrine metastases, there may be a role for surgical therapy. Less clear as these new emerging systemic and regional therapies demonstrate better and better efficacy, but clearly as of now, guidelines clearly point to an important role of surgical therapy. So what is the role, is there a role for surgical management? I think the answer is clear, yes. <laughs>